Thank you, David. So, uh, two parts again. The first part is called Three Ways Ontologies Fail, and then I'm going to try and draw some lessons for the Navy Systems Engineering transformation to show how we might finally make ontologies succeed. And then part two is about the uh, ontology for the product life cycle, and there I will use aircraft as my um, uh, starting point. I guess the Navy has something to do with aircraft, so uh, uh, I, I'm hoping that, that uh, this will all fit together. This is an enterprise data model uh, which was taken from uh, Schneider Incorporated. You can see that it's a pretty large model and th this is uh, the kind of model which shows the problems that enterprises have when they start using SysML or systems uh, engineering model technologies in order to steer their activities and exploit their capabilities. Basically what happens is that over time the models get bigger and more complicated and the terminologies that people use to populate the models change slowly, often in ways that people do not uh, realize, so that the very people who built the model three years ago can't themselves remember what the codes inside the model mean. And so you have a kind of uh, erosion of model coherence and one strategy to prevent such model coherence and to enable search through the information contained in model, model coherence, and to enable search through the information contained in models, and to enable consistency checking for models, is to use ontology technology. And that is part of the idea that we are exploring within the Navy systems engineering transformation. And um, so the problem I is that for the Navy, the data tables are huge. Um, it, it's reckoned that the Navy SISCOMs have of the order of 100,000 data tables. And the problem is that as, as the, the military itself becomes more and more invested in joint operations, the Navy itself has to develop these tables and exchange data in these tables with other organizations. They can't even query their own tables without a, a deep knowledge of the way the tables are organized and populated. And this means that they, they rely on human beings who have that deep knowledge and this is not scalable as become more and more joined up and as the technology becomes more and more information driven rather than people driven. So an ontology is roughly a computable lexicon. This is, it's very roughly that. It's more than that because it, it enables you to compute with data. And in the view of ontology, which I've been defending now for more than 20 years, uh, you, you build an ontology by working out what types of entities there are in your domain. So you don't look at the data, you look at the domain that you're interested in, whether it's ships or military operations or uh, genome biology. And you try and work out what are the relations between those entities. So what causes what? What is an ancestor of what? What is a subtype of what? So is a, sh a ship is a subtype of platform, for instance. And then you create axioms which link together. A, sh a ship is a subtype of platform, for instance. And then you create axioms which link together the names of the types in logical relations such as, for instance, ship subtype of platform. And you use ontology software, so Protégé is the main uh, ontology editing tool in order to incorporate information about types using names and relations into an artifact called an ontology or an ontolo ontology formalization. Now, what this enables you to do is to tag the data about those types of entities. So all the data you have about ships, you're going to tag with the ontology term ship. And all the data you have about platforms, you're going to tag with the ontology term platform. And then you, you know about ships is also data you have about platforms. This is obviously a very simple example but if we have thousands of such axioms, then as a result of tagging the data with the ontology, we make the data more intelligent. The data becomes computable. Now, databases of the more traditional sort can do a lot of this, but databases, the relational database technology that we're used to, is not easily extendable. 
if you have a new column in your database that you need to link to all your other databases, you will find it very hard to do this. If you need to add a new table to your database, you'll find it very hard to do this, particularly within the context of a large set of databases, such as the kind that are uh, created by large enterprises. Ontologies, on the other hand, can be extended easily. You can add new branches to the ontology, you can add new axioms to the ontology, and the new axioms immediately, you can add new axioms to the ontology, and the new axioms immediately become available for, for computation. And they become available for computation also in testing for the consistency of your data or, if you're moving into systems engineering, of your models. You can use the ontologies, or this is the goal of our uh, effort at least, you can use the ontologies to test the consistency of SysML models. And this is already being done by the, uh, the project of NASA JPL to create ontology support for SysML modeling in the area of uh, the Mars mission. So there is some success already in a very limited area to, uh, to show that you can use ontology technology to check consistency of models. So the rough idea underlying the Navy Syscom's effort is for all of the activities of the Navy Syscom's and then to promote discoverability of the content of these models and consistency of the models themselves by using some ontology counterpart of the models and using ontology reasoners which are already an established technology. So the idea is that if you have two SysML models you may know that each one of them is consistent but do, are they the two of them consistent if you fit them together? Ontology it, it seems bears the promise of being able to help you settle consistency questions like that on the fly in milliseconds. Now, um, all of this started in, uh, in the time of Aristotle, who was the first person to develop ontologies. He developed an ontology of um, constitutions of countries, for it, which was unfortunately lost. Uh, they didn't have good database technology. And he of um, constitutions of countries, for it, which was unfortunately lost. Uh, they didn't have good database technology in Aristotle's time. Uh, but then ontology as a, uh, a, 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 an approach to supporting database design and application was rediscovered in Stanford in the era of strong AI in the 1970s. And the, the world's first prominent ontologist within that school of thought was Tom Gruber, Gruber who is responsible for the ontologies inside your iPhone. The work of Gruber and his associates led to the creation in the 1990s of something called the Semantic Web and of the ontology language OWL. OWL stands for Web Ontology Language. And in, in the 1990s also we have the first ontologies in the realm of engineering. Uh, we have the Protégé Ontology Editing Software which was also uh, cr created in Stanford. And then OWL was released in 2004. Now, ontology is connected not just with discoverability of the content of models and databases and with consistency checking and reasoning across data. It's also connected with interoperability. And I think actually the most important reason to be interested in ontologies is to, to advance interoperability. Now, interoperability, as the military recognizes, is indispensable to joint action. You can't have joint action unless People use the same language, but in nowadays where joint in action doesn't just involve human war fighters, it also involves systems, information systems, you have to have interoperability between people and computers. And this was recognized in DOD instruction 8330.01, and it's been implemented. And it, .01, and it's been implemented. And it was implemented in an, another DOD instruction 8320.02 on sharing data information and information technology. And this is going to be my first example showing how ontologies fail. So how did the um, DOD foresee the conformance checking 
for interoperability. So they have declared that interoperability is required. How will they achieve it where information systems are concerned? Well, the answer is that the, this instruction requires that all authoritative data sources be registered in something called DSE. That's the Data Services Environment, which is supposed to contain the structural and semantic metadata critical to and so on. So this was the solution. You're going to force it to interoperability. So we looked, and there is one example, which I, uh, I, it, it's relevant to the syscoms because it's about acquisition. This is called the Acquisition Community Connection, developed by DISA. And you can find terms, if it's still there, uh, at this link. And I chose eight terms at random just to see how well they provide metadata for uh, consistency checking of the sort required. And metadata means primarily definitions. And these definitions should be logically formulated so that we can do consistency checking. So if you look at the, um, the, the, the terms and where they were taken from, you, would, you will see that they're taken from multiple different places. So the term architecture, which is where I'm starting now, is taken from an IEEE document. Uh, the term integrated architecture is taken from Dota, and where I'm starting now, is taken from an IEEE document. Uh, the term integrated architecture is taken from DODAF. The term enterprising uh, architecture is taken from something from Virginia, and so on. Each of these terms is taken from a different place. So we are running into dangerous territory here. And if you look at the actual definitions, you see that they are just porridge. They do not hang together in any logical way. So architecture, on the one hand, is defined as the fundamental organization of a system. Integrated architecture, on the other hand, is defined as multiple views and perspectives, which doesn't seem very promising. Um, so, and system architecture is defined as the composite of a system. Right. Yep. You're there? Yep. Good. Uh, they do not constitute definitions of a sort which will enable uh, the, the application of ontology tools in order to check for consistency. Now, eventually in 2016, there was a mem memorandum for, for program managers called Program Sunset. The data service environment is being abandoned. It didn't work. It did not support interoperability. Now, how would we support in interoperability? How do we do it right? And uh, so the answer is we define architecture. And we, we may even leave architecture as a primitive term. We don't need to worry about the definition of architecture in order to see what I am now going to illustrate. All that matters is that we use architecture as the basis for defining other terms. So we define integrated architecture as an architecture which is in starting point for a definition. And similarly, we define system architecture as an architecture of a system. And we define open system architecture as a system architecture which is open, and so on. And when we do that, we get an ontology, which is in, in its core a hierarchy, a taxonomy. And you can see now, we can reason across this taxonomy. We can infer that every open system architecture is also an architecture. So this part is not rocket science. But the acquisition community did not achieve this not rocket science contribution. They did not achieve an ontology when they produced their uh, acquisition connection artifact. <coughs> Next slide. So now there are three ways ontologies fail. We've just seen one of them. The acquisition community built an ontology. It was useful for them. It gave them a key to the meanings of certain terms. Acquisition connection artifact. <coughs> Next slide. So. Now, there are three ways ontologies fail. We've just seen one of them. The acquisition community built an ontology. It was useful for them. It gave them a key to the meanings of certain terms. It did not provide any of the metadata. It did not follow simple principles for building definitions. So it was created in a way which made it unusable for any other community. 
And that's the first way ontologies fail. Ontologies are created as silos. The second way ontologies fail is that they're built for specific data. So you don't look at the world, you don't look at the entities in the world, you look at the data you happen to have about certain things in the world. And you focus on the data and you build your ontology around the data that you happen to have. Now data changes very quickly. Hardware supporting data changes very quickly. Codes change very quickly. Personnel populate databases change very quickly. And so the ontology very quickly becomes useless. It becomes useless as soon as you need to populate your database with data from somewhere else because that data is going to be uh, not conformant to your ontology because your ontology was designed for the data you originally had. So this is the short half-life syndrome. And then the third way ontologies fail is that ontologies are created as standalone entities, as in the case of the acquisition connection. And I'll give you some more examples of this from the uh, engineering domain. So these are three Navy ontologies which I found on the web. They are standalone ontologies. No one ever used them properly. Um, they were created and, and, and placed somehow, probably in a research paper. And there was no guidance uh, being used in order to make these ontologies compatible with other ontologies. They are just standalone. Uh, standard ontologies has created standalone. So the W3C provenance ontology, which is very useful, very important for an effort like the SET for the Navy, and the semantic sensor network ontology, which is also very useful and very important for the effort of the Navy, they, these two ontologies should work well together. Sensor data has provenance, and it's important to know which sensor uh, and which kind of sensor and what kind of settings for that sensor led to this data. So you need to use the two ontologies together. But they were created independently of each other. So the top level terms of the provenance ontology are uh, entity in role, agent, activity, and so on. So that's one set of top level terms. And the semantic sensor network has top level terms we enroll, agent, activity, and so on. So that's one set of top level terms. And the semantic sensor network has top level terms which include feature of interest, place, platform, process, measurement property. Now, you could bolt these two ontologies together, but you'd have to do a lot of work. And the top level terms on these two slides are, are used in all the definitions of each of the two ontologies. So the definitions themselves are incompatible. You'd have to rewrite them all. Now, we can't use ontologies to promote the consistency of models or the consistency of anything if the ontologies themselves are not consistent with each other. They, weren't, they were not built in such a way as to interoperate. And so inter ontologies can support interoperability of information systems, of models, and so on, only if they are created of necessity something analogous to the systems engineering transformation of biology and now of medicine. Because the data coming from the Human Genome Project, the Mouse Genome Project, the Fly Genome Project is intelligible only with the aid of computers. And so biology became an information-driven discipline. And the, 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 the gene ontology, which was created by the people who were leading the efforts to create the human, the mouse, the fly, the fish genome, the gene ontology is an ontology not of genes. It's an ontology of gene product attributes, which means those pieces of information about the gene that is newly discovered, which every biologist will want to know first, namely information about where in the cell, what molecular function, and what biological process this gene is associated with. So the gene ontology was used to annotate gigantic bodies of data and literature over the years and turned that data into a gigantic unified database, unified through the fact that it was all annotated using one ontology, the gene ontology. And what I did in around 2004 was show how to extend the gene ontology in a coherent way to, to cover other parts of medicine. 
and other parts of biology, for instance, diseases, anatomy, and so forth. I didn't build the ontologies. What I showed was how to build the ontologies in such a way that they fitted together. And the, the key to that is basic formal ontology. OK, so we counteracted the silo system by creating the ontologies as interoperable modules within a single suite. That's the important word, suite. We called it the oboe, fo called it the oboe foundry, open biomedical ontologies foundry. And then to counteract the short half-life syndrome, we work not with the data, but with the entities. So the, the, the people who built the cell ontology or the protein ontology are experts on cells and proteins. And to counteract the reinvent the wheel system, we, we made everything use the same top level ontology and follow the same set of principles. And that's BFO and the principles associated with BFO. And the suite of ontologies that we built has this hub and spokes structure. So we have BFO as the hub. We have a set of mid-level ontologies, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then we have, building out from those, we have a set of domain ontologies. So um, this is how it looks for the, um, the, the starting point that we're taking for the Navy. So we have BFO at the top, and then we have the common core. The starting point that we're taking for the Navy so we have BFO at the top, and then we have the common core ontologies of things like places, artifacts, agents, information, and so on. And then we have domain ontologies such as aircraft, military operation, domain ontologies such as aircraft, military operation, spacecraft, and space event, and so on. And um, uh, B BFO is, it, there is a guidebook to how you build ontologies using BFO, and uh, it's a very small ontology. It has 34 nodes in the graph. It evolves very slowly. We're just now uh, unrolling a new version, which we are going to call BFO ISO. Uh, it's strictly formal in the sense that it doesn't have any domain-specific terms. It's domain neutral. So it has only boringly general terms like object and process. And, and so on. So it has all kinds of goodness, as the, as the Marines say. And there are 300 ontologies using BFO. Uh, and um, the, the BFO is on the road to becoming ISO standard. And um, the, the BFO is on the road to becoming ISO standard 21838-2. And this will mean that it's a standard top level ontology. So ISO 21838-1 documents the requirements for being a top level ontology. And now the benefits of a shared top level I hope are clear. So one benefit is that you have transportability of expertise. All the people who use BFO in one domain can transport their expertise to another domain to build the ontology for that domain following the same principles. So this is not standalone, silo-driven ontology. It's ontology which is designed to be easily exportable and thereby also uh, more or less automatically interoperable, at least to a certain degree, because the ontology is created by, uh, by the biologists. Mm -hmm. And this is a view, uh, no, so, sorry, the, the, uh, the, the, the short half-life system was sim syndrome was solved or resolved and this is the next slide by giving groups of experts ownership for the ontologies in their domain so that's the key you don't try and control all the ontologies for different domains from the center you have neutral principles which they can all follow and then they because they own their own domain they're going to be sure they're going to, they're going to work very hard to be sure that their domain ontology is maintained in such a way as to keep track of scientific advances. Uh, and we documented this in a paper called the Oboe Foundry in 2007. And, um, and now the question is, how do we create the counterpart of the Oboe Foundry in everything that the Navy uses? It, we're going to end up building something like this for the whole Navy. And the idea is that what the Navy needs is going to be pretty much what the Army and the Air Force need, and so on. So there, the, the, it, the potential 
is that this approach is going to be generalizable beyond the Navy Syscoms. And the strategy, as I say, is to focus not on the data, but on the people, the capabilities, the actions, the organizations that the Navy uses and divide into modules along the lines described. And um, so that's the hub and spokes again. And this is the joint doctrine hierarchy. So the joint doctrine hierarchy is a very similarly beautiful hierarchically organized body of artifacts. And there are many similarities between the approach that we've been taking within the ontology hierarchically organized body of artifacts. And there are many similarities between the approach that we've been taking within the ontology world and the, uh, the, the hierarchical approach taken by joint doctrine. So joint doctrine one is logically supervenient or logically superordinate to all the other do joint doctrines, which are in turn logically superordinate to all the service doctrines. And this is as a matter of law. So the, the, the Congress hath deemed that all service doctrines should be logically subservient to joint doctrine. And so what we do when we're building ontologies to support the Navy is to, as far as possible, use the content of joint doctrine, which is used in the authoritative dictionaries which are being built by the Navy SISCOM, speci specifically by Spaywar Atlantic, in order to use the Common Core ontologies in order to help the Navy produce ontology counterparts for the models that they are populating using terms taken from their dictionaries which are in turn resting to a large degree on the terms and definitions found in the joint doctrine pubs. And already we have built the joint doctrine ontology which will serve as a stepping stone towards solving the, the ontology problems of the uh, Navy SISCOMs. And we published this paper in which we, um, we set forth the idea that the Joint Doctrine Ontology, which is currently used as a benchmark for human warfighter training to give the terms and definitions that humans need to know the meanings of and be able to react to immediately, or because all of them are subject to the same body of training which is based on the be able to react to immediately, or because all of them are subject to the same body of training which is based on the same body of doctrine, we want this same body of doctrine to be active also in the domain of information systems. So we want information systems to be trained using the same joint doctrine terminology that we use for humans. And this is the, uh, the suite of dictionaries created by Spaywar. And you see we have activities, capabilities, organizations, and so on. And we can put these uh, terms together into a, a small top-level ontology view. And it looks like this. So activity is part of a warfare mission area. A platform is used in an activity. A, function possesses, a pa platform possesses a function. A function is realized in an activity, and so on. And then we can add more elements. So a person has a person role. Amphibious warfare is a, has a person role. Amphibious warfare is a kind of warfare mission area, and so on. And then we can, uh, we can distinguish classes from individuals. So the third fleet is an individual. A fleet is a class. And then we can draw pictures linking classes to individuals. So not that picture, but this picture. So the, that person there is an instance of the type person. And he has a role, which is the US Secretary of Defense role. And that is an instance of the type person role. And that role inheres in that person. And this is a temporal matter. Uh, so inhering in, or being the bearer of, is something which is dependent upon time. So it's not just that the US Secretary of Defense role is, uh, sorry, it's not just that the, that person is a bearer of that role, but also that that is a, is a time indexed bearer of relation, which is the next slide. And so this is something which the ontology will need to find a way of capturing. There are some relations which are 
independent of time. For instance, General Mattis is an instance of person at every time in which he exists, but General Mattis is a bearer of the uh, SecDef role only at certain times of which he exists. And um, so with the, what we will do is a very cautious layered application of these ideas to the Navy SET. So we're going to create terminological shadows of models. We're going to try and create graph theoretic shadows of models using OWL and RDF. And eventually, we will aim to uh, have more developed ontology content that will allow capturing a model's full content. And theoretic shadows of models using OWL and RDF. And eventually, we will aim to uh, have more developed ontology content that will allow capturing a model's full content. And um, um, even this is not a trivial exercise. Even creating a terminological shadow of, of a model is non-trivial non because new models are being developed all the time. Terminology is very often cont contested. The, we have dictionaries which have um, def definitions may not conform to the way the terms are used in models. So we, we still need to do a considerable amount of work to keep pace with the model development we would need to do a huge amount of work to capture all the legacy artifacts created by the Navy, which used to be collecting data and, and, and formulating plans, building systems not on the basis of SysML models, but on the basis of documents. And in the longer term, we, we hope to be able to use the ontology to make the content of those documents discoverable. Uh, but for the moment, we're focusing on the contents of SysML models. And, uh, and then similarly, if we want to create graphs for models to allow more sophisticated reasoning, that's going to involve more uh, ontology efforts. Some of this can be done, we hope, programmatically, but at, in the beginning phase anyway, it's going to have to be done manually. And then the experimental stuff, L1, we're going to be keeping track of system L2, experimenting with other uses of, of, of the ontology technology as we go. And I think I will. Uh, I'll stop part one at that point. Okay. And, uh, so we only have uh, one question so far. Um, and it got presented in two parts here, so I'll probably I'll try to read it. Um, so it says, has there been successes turning DOD or Navy system data into a consumable SysML library for engineers, and then it was elaborated by saying turn in a, turning an ontology. So one of the problems that we have encountered already, uh, and I guess this is, a, this is a general problem, is that first of all, uh, many of the models are classified, uh, and th thus they're not. Uh, av some people know those models very well, but outside the small group of people who maintain. The, the, use the models, it's very hard to find out where the models are and what the, uh, the, the procedures would be to gain access to them. So um, to answer your question specifically, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Jim, there is no, nothing like a library of models. Um, and I guess there will never be a library of models. But there, what, what, what there will be, and this is something that we're very keen on, is a library of ontologies. And so we're going to work very hard to make sure that the, the bulk of the work that we invest, the bulk of the content of the ontologies that we, we create will be in the public domain. It will be completely free for use by anybody. And some of it, we hope, will be f uh, used, for instance, by the Air Force. So a big part of what we do for Air Force ontology, for, for air ontology for uh, used, for instance, by the Air Force, so a big part of what we do for Air Force ontology, for, for Air ontology for NAVAIR, is going to be usable uh, by the Air Force. And we hope that they will use it. And we, we look forward to collaborations with the other forces. OK. Uh, let's see if we have another question that came in here. If I can scroll down to that. Uh, is the longer term approach to make ontology definitions tag attributes of system L model elements. So in the long term is the approach to make ontology definitions tagged attributes of system L model elements. 
I'm not sure if that's necessarily so your will probably address that. That, that is a, 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 a question to be decided after we have gone through the experimental phase of trying out various approaches and seeing how SysML and the SysML community develops. So we, there, there is no clear answer to that question. Okay, the next question is, how do you distinguish between an ontology and an application-specific model that uses an ontology? So I guess the one key virtue or attribute of ontologies is that they are tool neutral. So you can use the same ontology in multiple applications. So you tell the difference by seeing whether the ontology can be moved to, a, to and used by another application. Um, So that, uh, the one question was whether the, 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 the slides will be freely available. And yes, they will be freely available. And uh, with any luck, I'm going to make the video of, this, uh, of these briefs available on YouTube. Um, and I've, I've provided a link also in the notes section of this um, to Barry's website, which has So uh, uh, someone said they're not having luck with your link. Yeah. So that needs to be checked. Okay. Um, and I've, I've provided a link also in the notes section of this um, to Barry's website, which has... So, uh, uh, someone said they're not having luck with your link, yeah. so that needs to be checked. Okay. Um, I'll check on that. Um, so, John McCoy, um, how do you exploit, enable SBIR concepts without creating a barrier to entry? So, Jim, can you help me with that? So small business I initiative, res small business... Oh, I see. Research concepts. Good. So I think I can work out how, how to answer that question. Um, so the, um, the, the, the s hierarchy of ontologies with the top level ontology, the middle level ontology, the common core, and the domain ontologies works like this. The top two levels are completely open. That you, anyone can use them, you can steal them, you can rename them. Bottom, which I showed on the earlier slide, are also free and in the public domain. Some of them will be proprietary and some of them will be classified. But even the proprietary ones and the classified ones will exist in the portal that we are building for all of these ontologies. It's just that only their top level terms will be freely available. And the reason for that is that we want people to see what ontologies are being built by whom. And so if somebody has an ontology which conforms to the principles, we will quite willingly place it in the, in the portal in the appropriate place. We will check for redundancy and so forth. And if this ontology is proprietary or classified, then we will only post the top level so that people can identify it contact the creators of the ontology if that's, a, if that's possible for them. And other people will be warned that an ontology is being built and intellectual property and clearance. So uh, next question, um, coming in too quickly, I can't see him, um, is, let's pull down here. Uh, if we are still experimenting with how to implement ontologies within the engineering model data? How do they help us today? Okay, so uh, ontologies are helping uh, people already in other areas. So the application of ontologies to SysML engineering model data, that's the new part. And um, even that is not completely new. So the, the JPL NASA uh, ontology effort systems, techno semantic technology for systems engineering, S T for SE is an effort which is now uh, several years old. I believe it's eight years old. And that has already been doing the uh, linkage between OWL. And that has already been doing the uh, linkage between OWL and uh, SysML for, s for some time. And they, they have a pr pretty mature framework for doing that. So they are not anymore in the experimental phase. The problem is that their framework is focused narrowly on a very specific mission, namely the Mars mission, the Europa Clipper mission. And the SysML has been tailored for that mission, and so it's not generic SysML. And so what we're trying to do is to create a framework which is uh, based on generic SysML and which is extendable across multiple domains. And that's where 
the experimental character comes in. Okay, next question. Is BFO imposing limitations to description logic? DL? That is a very interesting question. So first of all, BFO exists in an OWL form. It's perfectly straightforward, plain vanilla. Experimenting with using more um, articulate ways of capturing time information using BFO, but we're not changing OWL in any way. We're using perfectly standard OWL. We're just devising new, new relations, new object properties, as the uh, OWL community would call them. But we're also cre creating a version of BFO which does not use description logic. It uses something called common logic. And common logic is a much more expressive language, which is an ISO standard uh, in its own right, which, which is based on classical first order predicate logic and which has many advantages because of its expressivity. So we believe we can capture more of the content of a system, SysML model, for instance, using the common logic version of BFO than is possible using OWL. However, that is truly experimental. That is really just now becoming possible because of the, of the new work that we're being done and just now becoming possible because of the, of the new work that we're being done in the recent months. Uh, do you think that ontologies replace data models, or will there just be data models developed based on the ontology? I wish. <laughs> um, so th one of the assumptions underlying the gene ontology and the oboe foundry ontologies in the initial period was that gradually da traditional databases would disappear and ontologies would be used uh, uh, as the alternative. So basically, databases of the relational site sort would be replaced by RDF triple stores and similar artifacts. This has not happened and there are multiple reasons for this and I, I believe that we should take those reasons seriously and be happy with a world in which there are data in many formats but to the maximal degree protected interoperable ontologies along the lines I've been describing. So I think that's that's for the foreseeable future, the best we can get. Moreover, there will always be legacy databases, and they, uh, they're, they're never going to be replaced by, uh, by triple stores. There'll be legacy do documents which are not going to be replaced by triple stores. Okay, so we'll take two more questions in this, in this first section, and then we'll take some more questions after the second part. Uh, how do efforts to develop a standard ontology relate to efforts to define a standard set of terms? Nearly every program office has a dictionary slash AV2 slash glossary. This is a very good question. So dictionaries and, and dictionary definitions are created to help human beings. So they're full of circularity. And that doesn't matter. It, circularity uh, of the second order where you define uh, the taste of lion meat in the terms of the taste of tiger meat, and then you define the taste of tiger meat in terms of the taste of lion meat. That is uh, the taste of lion meat in the terms of the taste of tiger meat, and then you define the taste of tiger meat in terms of the taste of lion meat. That is perfectly sa satisfactory for human beings. That helps. But it doesn't help computers. So what we get from a standard ontology is a way of formulating definitions in such a way that the computer can use the content of the definitions in reasoning. Moreover, since we use terms from ontologies in the definitions, so maybe we define a term in ontology A using terms from ontologies B, C, and D, writing the definitions creates networks, networking links between the ontologies, which can also be exploited by the computer. So that's the big difference. And that's why we need a version of joint doctrine, of the joint doctrine dictionary, which used to be called JP1-02, is now, now called the Dictionary of Military and Related Terms. We need the definitions in that dictionary to be... Uh, and the final question for part one, would a language like SysML be BFO compliant? Could the language itself be BFO compliant, compliant or would a specific implementation of the language in a tool be a BFO compliant? So that is a very good question. At the moment, I... My, my, I, I, I would say that I'm going to work very hard to find out the degree to which we can make some parts of SysML BFO compliant. That's as far as I will go. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to let Barry have a
drink of his water. <laughs> and, and we'll get off to the, uh, to the second part. And at the end of the second part, um, we will we'll take questions as well. So as we go through these slides, if you think of questions, feel free to jot them down in the chat, and we'll try to adjust them uh, with the time that we have at the end of this presentation. Good. Questions, feel free to jot them down in the chat, and we'll try to adjust them uh, with the time that we have at the end of this presentation. Good. So let me find my second deck. Okay. 